About two months ago, I found myself driving home to Oakland from Sacramento, California, having what felt like an existential crisis. After months with hardly a drop of rain, we drove in the dark through a complete downpour. I could barely hear myself think as the windshield wipers hit warp speed. I was in Sacramento with our partners to lobby for 100% clean energy legislation. A landmark bill, SB 100, was stalled in the State Assembly Energy Committee, two steps away from landing on the governor's desk to become law. The win it would be for our 100% vision was enormous, as we had put a ton of energy behind this bill. $250,000 to community advocates, weekend negotiations with stakeholders, we even got Captain America to call legislators. You have no idea how much I wanted, how much I needed this victory to happen. We were this close to putting the world's sixth largest global economy on the fast track to 100% clean energy. And the question, what can I do, kept replaying again and again and again in my head. What can I do to make this happen? That day in Sacramento, we had met with six key lawmakers or their top staff on the bill. In every one of the meetings, we heard the same opening. I want California to go to 100%. This is important for me and my district. But it nearly always followed with the same problem. It's out of my hands until we have a compromise for the electric utility. And therein was my existential crisis. That compromise would mean stalling or even stopping rooftop solar growth so the utility still controls the electric grid, making households or communities unable to own their own power. In its worst case, the hard-won success of a few cities across the state to start their own kind of electric co-ops would be over. On the other hand, resolving this issue was the path to victory. So here I am, in the car, in the rain, late to get home to my family, and running scenarios for how I, Sarah Shanley Hope, who had just spent my first day on the hill, as they say, could possibly save the day. Just when I was gearing up to take action the next morning, I got a call from our closest grantee partner in California, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network, who along with other frontline leaders had been working tirelessly for months on this and other priority bills. I've known Perrin, APEN's policy director, for a decade, beginning when our daughters were born on the same day, eight and a half years ago, and followed by almost weekly family dinners since. Good news is, our meeting yesterday had an impact. The bad news is, seems like De Leon, the bill's author, is giving everything to the utilities to get this through. I could hear him sigh on the other end of the line as a bad scenario was playing out. And then he said, well, we'll have to oppose the bill. You will too, right? My breath stopped as it got worse. Would we actually oppose the bill? Wouldn't it be better to get some glory and fix the rooftop solar thing later? The vision of SB 100 passing, my board elated, funders clamoring to get behind our 100% vision, our goal was within reach, all so close I could taste it. Before I let myself dig deeper, before I started asking myself, what can I do? A far more important question slowly surfaced in my mind. Who am I with? We ended up pulling our support from SB 100. And I know what some of you are thinking. The world is in peril. You've got kids, for goodness sake. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You were so close. Yes. And we've been close before, but you know who we should always choose to be closer to if we want lasting, substantive victory? Our people. 
As we witness what seems to be a worldwide awakening on climate change, we are asking ourselves the wrong question. In the nearly 20 years that I've worked in environmental activism, this is the most important lesson I've learned. Climate change isn't an environmental issue. It's a people problem. Climate change isn't an environmental problem. It's a people problem. Yes, the technical solutions we need to solve climate change are already here. But we must understand the leadership we need is also here and is of far greater importance. And that leadership isn't just the scientists, elected officials, big environmental organizations, or Elon Musk. In fact, they've been at the center of attention for quite a while, and here we are. The leadership that is also here and changing the game more and more is rooted in community. Like members of Asian Pacific Environmental Network in Richmond, California, living at the front lines of climate change extraction and pollution. Like Protect the Inlet and indigenous allies marching in the street against Kinder Morgan Pipeline and calling to keep it in the ground. Leadership as brilliant, as big, and as diverse as humanity offers is coming together to implement clean energy solutions that work for everyone. It is time we began to not only see, but partner with those leaders all around us because they hold our greatest strength. Who are you with must be the first question that we ask ourselves if we want to break through, if we want to win, if we want to bring about a better world. Our answer will not only determine who actually benefits from climate solutions, but it will ensure this inevitable transition to clean energy happens faster, that it happens for all of us. Now the public awakening that is happening is a huge step forward. The New York Times reported last month that nearly 70% of Americans now say that climate change is caused by humans. This is the highest percentage since Gallup began tracking it two decades ago. Research out of Yale shows that the upward trend in opinion is strongly tied to the fact that more people relate to climate change as a personal issue. They are hearing about it from their children, they are being organized by their neighbors, they are suffering the impacts of devastating hurricanes and wildfires or experiencing the benefits of affordable clean energy and green jobs. So if a conservative in the US who previously denied the mere existence of climate change is now converted through their relationships, can those of us in the climate movement do the reverse? Can we convert to prioritizing our relationships through our commitment to climate change? Can we ask ourselves, who am I with? How are we showing up for each other? What can we do together? I know these are questions being asked more and more within the environmental movement across our border. Here in Canada, great strides have been made in just the last five years. You've answered these questions more in right relationship with First Nations leadership and quickly increased victory against oil and gas pipelines. I cheer you on. That said, white environmentalists showing up for frontline communities, let alone following their leadership, is a very new thing and a major culture shift. And the truth is that as we, as we move more and more into relationship with others, especially across these power divides, I see us making missteps that increasingly knock us off course. Trust me, I can relate. When we first ask ourselves, what can I do? One of the biggest traps that we're falling into is this feeling of urgency around climate change. And it's understandable in 2017 alone, the U.S. was rocked by fires, floods, and hurricanes. 
We lose 12,528 lives to pollution each year as we continue to choose old, dirty energy to power. That's just in California. In Canada, 10,000 lives and $110 billion in related healthcare costs lost each year. We are in fear for our children's safety, our own survival. We care about the planet and its people. When you're dealing with this level of threat to the future of humanity, you'd think that sharing the direness of the situation far and wide would be enough to spark transformative change, right? But this urgency is actually a part of the problem. Studies in cognitive science and climate psychology, yes, that is now a field, have shown that when faced with the doom and gloom urgency of climate change, over time, humans of all persuasions freeze. Our fight or flight mode is triggered. With some of us screaming from our soapboxes or even in the faces of others, while the rest of us stand there numb, without a clear path to save ourselves or our beloveds. Ultimately, we go dark, experience cognitive dissonance, get depressed. As my friend and brilliant re narrative researcher Anat Shanker said, we cannot terrorize our way to more safety. Making people afraid makes them averse to change. Fear activates the amygdala. There is no room left for higher order reasoning. Whether in our relationships, organizations, or external work, constant urgency does not serve us. Another major trap we've been falling into is scarcity, which is like the eldest child of urgency. There is no doubt that climate change, gentrification, or any other large-scale social problem is threatening. The impacts are immediate and the outlook often grim. It is totally human to look at the situation and think, I'm running out of time, I don't have enough resources, they're going to get theirs, so I better get mine. For those of us who have lived in relative safety, healthy communities, steady paychecks, options if this career in activism doesn't work out, our default towards scarcity is not helpful. It breeds anxiety, competition, distrust, compromises towards the lowest common denominator rather than the maximum impact. In scarcity, we only see the data points of a zero-sum game in which we are losing. In asking what can I do on the 100% California legislation, my mind went from multiple pathways to victory down to one, a single bill that had to pass now, even if it sold out our partners in community and business. Scarcity limits our options and literally undermines our capacity to navigate the reality of what is possible. It also repels others that we need to join us. Who wants to enter an arena that we've already defined as losing and limited? The third trap, which is oh so familiar to me, is savior syndrome. You see, I am a good, smart, and responsible person. Faced with a problem, I am ready and willing to roll up my sleeves and fix it. But the reality is, the problems we face actually cannot and should not be solved by one knight in shining armor. As Naomi Klein says, to change everything takes everyone. The days of an iconic leader are over if they ever truly existed. The movement for black lives, the dreamers, Standing Rock, so many mass, mobiliz mass mobilizations right now reflect what many are calling a leader full approach. It's collaboration that's necessary to implement and scale the big, bold solutions we need. Each of these urgency that triggers a sense of uncontrollable loss, 
scarcity that limits options, and savior syndrome that crowds others out are quite literally the opposite of what's needed to inspire and move people to implement solutions. And I'm not saying it's wrong to care. I worry about my daughter's futures too. But sitting in a state of panic after going to Sacramento that day in January, I had to remind myself that this isn't just about their future world, my one shot at winning, or my righteous feelings of individual responsibility. This wasn't an existential crisis. And climate change isn't just an existential issue. It's relational. It's societal. It's not just about me. It's about all of us. There is a kind of saviorism that surfaces for white progressives, in particular in these moments, that we must abandon. This is a really uncomfortable realization, and it is liberating. When I asked myself, who am I with, that day after going to Sacramento, I returned to my breath and let it fall deep into my belly while the answer became clear as day. I am with Perrin and our daughters. I am with our grantee partners, who now hold a many-year record of winning bold, equitable clean energy policy in California. I am with innovators in business and local government who are bringing affordable clean energy into the hands of everyday people with rooftop solar shared renewables and municipal utility models that pay prevailing wage. I am with workers and those labor unions who see the transition happening and the great opportunity of good green jobs. And as I thought about it, I realized even in the moment when this particular bill was slipping away, this was actually a moment of leadership and even a marker of success. One year ago, this support for 100% was not here, even in California. Five years ago, then San Francisco mayor, the greenest in the country, in our country at the time, and now lead candidate for governor of California, laughed our founders out of the room for their naive vision. And now, 100% was not only possible, it was happening. But passing SB 100 wasn't it. We got here in just five years by investing in relationships, inspiring the public and decision makers to see themselves in 100%, and connecting all kinds of leaders, unlikely allies, making this vision a reality. Just imagine what we can achieve if we continue to do it together. I realized that taking California to 100% is no longer a matter of if, but when. In this transformational moment, a better question to ask is who am I with? When we address climate change from a relational perspective, we inspire a movement with purpose, abundance, and connection. I've learned about this transformation from repeated mistakes and also from Solutions Project's 50 plus grassroots grantee partners across the US, most of whom have lived experiences of extreme inequity and long-term harm. Those lives lost every year to pollution, the vast majority are in low-income communities and communities of color, where dirty energy prices are actually the highest and where community organizations with the moral and strategic authority receive a fraction of the funding without any capital to take risks or scale success. For those leaders, there is truth in urgency, scarcity, and heroism. Lives are quite literally on the line every day. And yet, those leaders almost always ask first, who am I with? How are we showing up for each other? What can we do together? 
That is the basis of community organizing. That's the premise of alliance, coalition, and network building. That's the brilliance of community-determined clean energy. When we ask, who am I with, we find ourselves walking a path together that is celebratory, inclusive, and collaborative. We can look into each other's eyes and see beauty, courage, and greatness. We can do good work together, but also sing and dance on the path to 100%. We can practice hope as a verb, our actions taking the form of superpowers revealed in our relationships with each other, what we co-create, and the choices we make every single day. We at The Solutions Project understand that 100% clean energy is possible. While the Paris Accord in December 2015 marked a tipping point in corporate, governmental, and community belief in this vision, 2017 is the year that vision became reality. With now 100 global cities already running almost entirely on 100% clean electricity. 61 committed U.S. cities, legislation pending in at least six U.S. states, and 68 nonprofit organizations sharing our 100% vision across the U.S. and Canada. Right here at Simon Fraser University, hundreds have gathered for an annual 100% renewables conference, and Vancouver is already implementing on its 100% commitment. 100% is no longer just an idea. It is happening. Since I joined Solutions Project a little more than four years ago, I knew that to create 100% clean energy, our organization had to answer the question, who are we with? The founders already began with a more relational approach by bringing science, business, and culture together around 100%. I brought community forward and focused our programs accordingly. This meant celebrating purpose-driven clean energy leaders by amplifying their stories of success for audiences well beyond the environmental movement. It meant launching a grassroots grant-making program to be sure those frontline organizations rooted in our country's most impacted yet under-resourced communities were not only included but leading on 100%. It meant connecting leaders through events and with tools to grow our collective power. Answering the question, who are we with and what can we do together, has brought human energy to the center of a movement to power our lives 100% with the wind, water, and sun. In a very short time period, we have cultivated fertile ground for a path traveled by more and more diverse people making 100% for all happen and the we is ever growing. Take the story of the 27th US city to commit to 100%, Atlanta. This commitment had a lot stacked against it, a fraught political champion, a hotly contested mayoral race, and a starting point of maybe 2% renewables. The we that came together in Atlanta includes Nathaniel Smith, a community leader from Partnership for Southern Equity, who worked to ensure the voices of the most vulnerable in Atlanta had a seat at the table. Shan Aurora from South Face brought forward both technical expertise and trusted relationships across business, community, and government. Stephanie Stuckey, Atlanta Sustainability Officer, not only kept the 100% planning process on track during a mayoral election, but prioritized community participation. And Solutions Project? In addition to providing grant dollars for community leadership, we brought in celebrities and social influencers to celebrate our partners working on the ground and bring this commitment into the mainstream. The outcome of this very different approach? The elected mayor doubled down on her commitment to 100% and anchored it in the principles of equity, access, affordability, and opportunity for those most vulnerable. If climate change is a people problem, then humans and our relationships with one another need to be at the center of the solutions.
By first asking who am I with, each of us can at any given moment do our part to change the culture of our movements from one of individual urgency to a culture of purposeful community, from a culture of scarcity to one of abundance, from a culture of countless and homogenous saviors to one of connected, diverse leaders. Together, we can power our lives with 100% clean, renewable energy. And this will not be easy work. You can imagine how fun it was to tell my board that next day after coming back from Sacramento that we can't support a bill that would have been our organization's greatest success point to date. The thing is, what feels righteous isn't necessarily what's right, and it is rarely what is needed to be in right relationship with each other, like I was called to be with Perrin and our partners. This is what I have found is the surest path to the world we want. One of my biggest inspirations of this is my hometown of Buffalo, New York, a post-industrial northern border town known for its snow, Super Bowl losses, and economic collapse. A little more than 10 years ago, my friend Aaron Bartley returned to this city knowing the legacy of neglect. Population loss, abandoned homes, few good jobs, all doom and gloom. Rather than try to fix the city with a revitalization campaign or whatever solution he came up with on his own, he began knocking on doors to learn from the people who lived there. He asked questions and listened to residents who spoke of problems, but also of the solutions they imagined. Together, they started a community organization where neighborhood members set the program agenda and decision making. In 10 years, Push Buffalo raised funds and cultivated leadership to control 130 city lots, transforming abandoned properties into a land trust that provided affordable housing and wealth building for residents. They started businesses, home weatherization, landscaping, solar and geothermal installation, urban farms, that employ hundreds of residents. You can meet people working in literally every green job imaginable and see sustainable energy, water, and food systems in practice. Brownfields are brought back to life by compost. Traumatized people are brought back to life by community. And now they are working to move Buffalo to an equitable 100% clean energy future. Refugee artist Rawa Garmatsyan, a resilient human of epic proportions, now leads the organization. She brought mothers, uncles, students, elders, immigrants, DJs, entrepreneurs, activists, cooks to the table. They all came around that table to set the vision together and make it a reality. To change everything takes everyone. As you leave tonight, I'd like you to think about the table you might sit at and who else might be around it, regardless of your own life's work. Because this isn't just about solving climate change. This is about creating a sustainable, equitable future for all of us. So let's activate the leaders in all of us. Thank you. Thank you.